Okay, great. Thank you, everybody. I'm going to let Evan Weiner take it over for the history of the Super Bowl. Well, thank you, Nadia, and thank you to the library for inviting me. And this is my last Super Bowl talk of the year, and it actually ties into Black History Month. And so it's kind of a hybrid between the Super Bowl and Black History Month because without uh, an African-American boycott of an all-star game in New Orleans in 1965, it might not have been a Super Bowl as we know it today. Um, that is me, that is Phil Sims back in uh, 1982, New York Giants training camp. And that is in Pleasantville, uh, New York at Pace University. And I've known Phil for about 40 years and uh, every once in a while, I'll remind him that uh, he, was, he would rather be eating a banana than talking to me or me asking him some inane question about, uh, you know, are you gonna give the ball to this guy or this guy? Is he gonna run right, left or in the middle? Uh, Phil was an MVP of the Super Bowl back in 1987 when the Giants beat the Denver Broncos. Um, and that was in Pasadena. So the Giants won that game and won their first Super Bowl. Uh, the Super Bowl, uh, well, there is a lot of fathers to the Super Bowl. The Super Bowl was created by an act of Congress. Congress passed legislation allowing the merger of the American Football League and National Football Leagues. The merger was tacked on to an anti-inflation bill and signed into law by President Lyndon Johnson, November 8th of 1966. Before I get into the Super Bowl per se, uh, let's talk a little bit about security because this is the most secured event annually in the United States with the exception of presidential inaugurals, whether that was 2021, 2017, 2013, 2009, et cetera. Uh, the lead security agency on this is the United States Secret Service. Um, the Super Bowl is a special events assessment rating level one event. There are 50 agencies who have been working for a year and a half uh, in the ground, on the ground in Tampa, and actually two and a half years in Florida because last year's game was uh, north of Miami. And um, they're making sure that the event is secure. There's no Black Sunday problem here, the old movie. Uh, there's no word on how much taxpayers put up to provide security. NFL doesn't pay any money to help secure the event. Uh, Secret Service is the lead agency, the FBI, FEMA, TSA, the Customs and Border Patrol. You know, you got to watch out for those counterfeit uh, shirts with those logos on it because the NFL may lose some money on that. Anyway, that's their job to crack down on the counterfeit shirts. Uh, and local police. Um, this year, Tampa, uh, Hillsborough County, uh, maybe Pinellas County, maybe Polk County and the Florida State Police, all part of that security team. And uh, the new security team for next year's game, which is going to be outside of Los Angeles in Englewood, California. They've been on the ground there since August securing that Super Bowl. Uh, if you look at this picture closely, it, you probably see a bunch of guys there at an airport counter yeah, waiting, you know, maybe to make sure their luggage has gone through or their credit card has gone through. Well, these guys are football pioneers, and these guys are not talked about all that much. That is Butch Bird on the right, the Buffalo Bills, and Earl Faison behind him, or actually uh, in the back with the fedora on, looking straight ahead. I don't know who this guy is with his hand over his ear, looking down at the counter with the fedora. Curtis McClinton, who is a running back with the Kansas City Chiefs, has what looks like airplane tickets in his hands. These guys are leaving New Orleans. They were supposed to be in New Orleans to play the American Football League All-Star Game with the intention at halftime at Tulane Stadium that New Orleans was going to get an American Football League team led by a guy by the name of Dave Dixon. But as uh, the old poet wrote, uh, plants of mice and men often go awry. This one goes right awry, uh, goes right awry try saying that five times fast, uh, within 36 hours. Uh, quick background of uh, what happened here and how the Super Bowl came out of it. Civil Rights Act passed by Lyndon Johnson July 7th, 1964. Jim Crow laws in the South. New Orleans, a player's boycott. Louisiana Senator Russell Long. 
a Louisiana House member, Hal Boggs, the father of uh, Koki Roberts, uh, formerly the late Koki Roberts uh, of NPR and ABC. The Brooklyn Democrat, House of Representative member, Emanuel Seller. They're all part of the Super Bowl creation by accident and design. Now this guy here, his name is Ron Mix. He's about 83 year, 84 years old now, uh, had been a lawyer up until about four years ago. And I've known him for quite a while. And back in 2014, when the National Basketball Association, Los Angeles Clippers owner, Donald Sterling told his mistress, don't bring black guys around the game anymore, games anymore, so I don't wanna see them around here. And she leaked it to TMZ, Harvey Levin, who put it on his website and then on his TMZ show. And the Clippers players found out about it and they were furious and uh, decided that they were gonna go on strike. They were not going to play for Donald Sterling anymore and they threatened to strike during the NBA playoffs. Um, they didn't have to. Within three days, all the marketing partners had pulled out of the Los Angeles Clippers uh, business deals that they had had. And the NBA commissioner, Adam Silver, yanked the franchise from Donald Sterling. Uh, so I called up Ron Mix, I've known him for quite a while, and I said, you were in New Orleans for that boycott. Uh, and I was writing for the Daily Beast at the time. I said, can you tell me the difference between what the Clippers players threatened and what you actually went ahead and did boycott? He said, it was pretty simple. Um, in the Clippers basketball players case, um, they were upset with their owner and they wanted their owner gone. In our case, we were fighting against Jim Crow rules. We were fighting for civil rights and we did the right thing. I'm going to give you a Ron Mix quote. Uh, this is from 2014. We were aware that New Orleans was hosting the game to demonstrate to the American Football League and the National Football League they, New Orleans, could support the football franchise. The last thing we wanted to do was assist them in demonstrating they could support the franchise. A boycott was the only alternative for the players. Uh, this was not the first time that New Orleans was the scene of a sports boycott. Uh, the first one was in 1961 by this guy, Walter Beach. Walter Beach was a defensive back with the Boston Patriots in 1960 and 1961. The Boston Patriots were heading to New Orleans to play a preseason game in August of 1961. And Walter Beach was keenly aware of what was going on in New Orleans in terms of race relations. And he told Billy Sullivan, the owner of the team, Mike Hollaback, who was the general manager and coach of the Boston team, I'm a football player. I'm going down to New Orleans on a business trip. I'm a football player. I expect to stay with my teammates at the hotel, eat with them at the hotel, take the bus to the game, and then fly back to Boston all as one. And uh, Billy Sullivan and Mike Hollaback weren't too happy to hear that Walter Beach did not want the Green Book, and you probably have that movie the DVD, The Green Book in the Library, which was a pretty good movie. And uh, he, he said, uh, and they said to him, no, no, you're going to, they have customs there. You're going to go to a host family. You're going to eat with them. Uh, how an NFL team or even an AFL team in 1961 traveled was this. You flew into a city and then you took a bus to the hotel. You stayed at the hotel. You took the bus from the hotel to the stadium played the game, took a bus back from the stadium to uh, the uh, airport, and flew home. And Walter Beach did not want to go cross town and couldn't get a cab. Black guys in New Orleans back in 1961 couldn't get a cab unless they were accompanied by a white passenger. So he didn't want any of that going cross town and rickety travel and staying with the family and eating with the family. And then the bus problem. Uh, he couldn't get on the bus, he couldn't get on the same bus as his teammates going to the game or going from the game to the airport. And uh, for all that, he decided, uh, or the Patriots decided, he's a troublemaker. He's a troublemaker because he's organizing protest among the black players against segregation, the living conditions during a road trip, which wouldn't last no more than 36 hours to New Orleans. So he's fired. He was picked up by the Cleveland Browns played on their 1964 championship team, and uh, eventually would be part of something called the Cleveland Summit, which was uh, the former Browns running back, Jim Brown, 
my buddy Walt Flea Roberts, a very young uh, Lou Alcindor Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. And uh, the summit was put together because Muhammad Ali refused to go into the armed forces, citing that he was a conscientious objector. And uh, he was stripped of his boxing license by the state of New York and others and lost his heavyweight championship. So the Cleveland summit people uh, decided to meet with him to see if he was legit and he was a conscientious objector. They decided that he was. Walter Beach is still alive and he's still fighting for civil rights, uh, still in the Cleveland area. Uh, Cookie Gilchrist was a running back with the Buffalo Bills and Cookie Gilchrist did get a ride into New Orleans. Um, the deal was the American Football League, Lamar Hunt, the owner of uh, the Kansas City Chiefs um, and the founder of the league in 1956, knew this guy, Dave Dixon, down in New Orleans who wanted to get a football team. In fact, Dave Dixon was trying to bring the Oakland Raiders to New Orleans back in uh, after the 1961 season for the 1962 year. Uh, he failed because Oakland asked for more time to find and owner locally to keep the team in town. And that's what they did. Um, but David Dixon was a guy who said to Lamar Hunt, we want the all-star game. I'm willing to take on the team, come down to Tulane. Everybody is going to be greeted with open arms. Everything is going to be great. So Cookie Gilchrist comes in from Buffalo and he does get a cab because uh, his quarterback on the team, Jack Kemp, also, the uh, president of the American Football League Players Association is with him. Kemp hails a cab. Gilchrist goes in. He can go in because uh, if you're a, and this is the terminology used in those days, if you're a colored guy, you could go into a cab with a white guy because the white guy will vouch for you and be responsible for whatever you do. So he was able to get to the either the Hotel Roosevelt or the Fountain Blue. Why New Orleans? Why was this game in New Orleans? Well. Dave Dixon uh, and other business leaders, along with the governor of Louisiana and the mayor of New Orleans, said, hey, the city is going to welcome all the all-stars with open arms, even the 22 black players. And you know what? Tell them to bring their families down here. Well, you can't really go swimming uh, in New Orleans in uh, January, but you can do a whole bunch of other things in New Orleans. You can play golf. You can go to Bourbon Street. You can have a good time because Listen, segregation, thing of the past. Jim Crow, thing of the past. Johnson signs the Civil Rights Bill into act on July 7th, 1964. And we desperately, desperately, desperately won a professional team. 22 black players in an all-star game is an awfully high number uh, of black players in a league in 1964, 1965, because Take a look at this program from San Diego uh, in 1965, two years earlier. You got the coaches, Pop Ivy from uh, Houston and Henry, Hank Stram from the Kansas City Chiefs. Hank Stram was an offensive coordinator in Purdue University, at Purdue University, when George Steinbrenner was his uh, running, running backs coach back in the 1950s. Anyway, so take a look at uh, the players. There are eight players under uh, Pop Ivy and Hank Stram. There's Charlie Hennigan. There's Lenny Dawson. Uh, there's uh, Jim Coclaw. There is Bud McFadden. There is Larry Grantham, uh, then the New York Titans. And then you have, so there's five white guys. And then you have Cookie Gilchrist, Fred the Hammer Williamson, and Earl Faison, three black guys. Um, so you have 37.5% of the people on the program who are African-American. Highly, highly unusual at that point uh, in football and in all sports. Uh, the American Football League at that time was the only league to truly embrace African-American athletes as an equal on the field with white players. That's Irv Cross. I've known Irv Cross for a very long time. He's up in Minneapolis now. And uh, we were talking I wanted to find out how he was doing with COVID and I didn't ask him about his old football injuries because he's not going to tell me about them he, because he never complains about them from football. But uh, he was, uh, you know, I said, how's things with COVID? He says, oh, I'm okay. I'm taking care of myself. And uh, he said, what's up with you? I said, well, I just finished a whole bunch of um, Super Bowl talks. And he said, how'd they go? I said, I think they were okay. And I talked about the quota and he kind of laughed the quota. Uh, I said, yeah, four Negro players per team uh, in the NFL back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. And he said, hold on, hold on, hold on one second. Let me think about that. He said, 
I was with the Philadelphia Eagles in 1961. So let me think of the roster. And then he said, Tim Brown, Ted Dean, Clarence Peaks, me. There we could go. There are the four players. Most NFL teams had no more than four players. And the Washington team did not desegregate until 1962, when forced to by the Kennedy administration because the owner of the team, George Preston Marshall, who was a racist, he told everybody he was a racist. You know, nobody nobody uh, said anything different. He didn't dissuade anybody from thinking that he was a racist. Uh, wanted to use the new stadium in Washington, which was built with federal money. And the Kennedy administration said, um, you have to desegregate in order to play there because it's equal opportunity employment and it's federal dollars. He found out he liked money more than he did his racist tenants. And uh, he did hire a, a Negro player, Bobby Mitchell, eventually and uh, got into the new stadium, made more money. NFL scouts went to watch players from the big time schools, the big 10 schools in the South, uh, big time conferences. While the AFL, they start 1959 for the 1960 season, they're looking for players with a different background. Uh, they're getting guys off the street who hadn't played. Uh, George Blander retired after 1958 with the Chicago Bears. He came back in 1960 with Houston. Don Maynard, uh, the New York Jets Hall of Fame wide receiver, uh, ended up uh, being cut by the Giants in 1958. He was in Hamilton in 1959 and signed with the Titans in 1960 before they became the Jets. So they were looking for guys off the street anywhere, anywhere, including uh, players from the uh, tr historic traditional black schools, including Grambling University in Louisiana, Bethune Cookman in Florida, and Prairie View in Texas, North Carolina A&T, Morgan State, Maryland, Southern University and A&M College in Louisiana, Texas A&I as well. Um, and they found a lot of good football players, really a lot of really, really good football players. Ironically, the Civil Rights Act of 1964 destroyed the black college football programs as the best players could attend the big schools. That is my friend Abner Haynes. Abner is about, what, 84 years old now? Uh, lives in the Dallas area. And uh, a number of years ago, maybe about 10 years ago, he said, hey, I want to write a, an autobiography or a biography. How would you like to do it with me? I said, Abner, you need somebody better than me. I said, uh, I don't write those kind of books. Uh, I could write an 800 word comprehensive op-ed piece for say Newsday, which I did between 2004 and 2000, 2001 and 2005. Or I could put together a 40 second radio spot complete with an actuality or somebody explaining something within the story. I could do that fine. I don't think I could do a biography justice. Uh, Abner told me a whole bunch of stories, uh, including being the first African-American player to play college football regularly in Texas back in 1956 with North Texas University. So he's telling me all these stories, but for our purposes here, I'm only going to tell you one story, and that's uh, the, Super, uh, the New Orleans story leading up to the Super Bowl. He's a member of the American Football League All-Star team, and uh, his owner, uh, Lamar Hunt, said name, rank, and serial number. Abner Haynes, running back Kansas City Chiefs, member of the American Football League All-Star team. And uh, so he flies into um, New Orleans, he and David Grayson, and they get to the airport and uh, they find out they can't get a cab. They can't get a cab at all. And they're sitting and they're waiting and they're watching all the white players hop in the cabs, go to downtown New Orleans and do whatever they were doing after they get from the airport to downtown. The airport now is called Louis Armstrong Airport. And uh, so Abner is uh, sitting there for three and a half hours, along with David Grayson and all these other guys, waiting for a cab. Uh, eventually, somebody calls up Jack Kemp or somebody at one of the hotels and said, hey, we got all of our guys at the airport. They can't get cabs. Well, Kemp or somebody calls up the Houston Oilers owner, Bud Adams, one of the co-founders of the American Football League, says, we got a whole bunch of guys sitting at the airport. They can't get cabs. Well, uh, Adams is on the phone almost immediately calling the governor of Louisiana saying, hey, wait, this was all worked out. These guys were supposed to get cabs. What happened? Well, eventually the governor of Louisiana sends out the colored cabs for the colored players. Abner Haynes does get to the hotel 
And uh, he checks in with David Grayson, no problems checking in. And then he walks uh, to the elevator and it's one of these old style, old hotel elevators that has, you know, opens the door, you see a fence, somebody is sitting there and they're operating the elevator with a crank. And so um, the door opens up, the lady who's sitting there opens the fence. Abner says she was an elderly white woman. And she looks up at Abner and she looks up at David Grayson and says, hey, monkeys, what are you doing here? Abner, this is him. This, the, this is what he told me. This is him talking, not me. They had a woman operating the elevator and she said, you monkeys, come on in, get to the back. Finally, we had about 10 or 12 guys in my room. We're talking sensibly. We are going to stay together. This was just another test. Well, the test in New Orleans consisted of waiting three and a half hours to get a cab and then being called names. And it gets worse. Ernie Ladd, Ernie Ladd was six foot nine, weighed 315 pounds, went to Grambling University in Louisiana. So he and his San Diego teammates, Dick Westmoreland, along with Earl Faison, decide they're going to go hit Bourbon Street because if you're in New Orleans, that's what you do. You go to Bourbon Street. And so they're walking and they hear the sounds of James Brown uh, in one of the places and say, hey, you know, it's James Brown, number one soul brother. We could go in there and, you know, we'll have a good time. So let's go. Well, they go in there and there's a bouncer there saying, uh, you want to come in here? And the Ernie Ladd, six foot nine, 315 pounds, says, I'm coming in. And guys, said, no, no, no. You don't want to come in here. And then there's a gun that somehow is flashed in the player's Flee. So they're all talking about what is going on here in terms of what is going on. And um, these guys say, hey, we can't deal with this right now. We really can't deal with this right now. Uh, let's talk about what's going to happen here and whether or not we should play here. Back to Abner Haynes. We had no leverage. We weren't playing for money, but we were playing for progress. The football players took the lead. Now, I stopped Abner there, and I said, well, what about Randolph and Franklin Roosevelt, 1941? What about W.E.B. Du Bois, uh, Du Bois, rather? Uh, what about Rosa Parks? What about Martin Luther King? And he said, as athletes, football players took the lead. And he's right, with Walter Beach back in 1961. Places like Atlanta, New Orleans, Miami were death holes. Dave Grayson couldn't get a drink at the bar. Our white teammates in New Orleans were there for us. Guys like him. That is Jack Kemp. He was the quarterback of the Buffalo Bills back in 1964, member of that 1965 American Football League All-Star team. He was also the American Football League Players Association president, and he was also a Barry Goldwater delegate and also was campaigning for the Goldwater, who was running for president as a Republican in 1964. So put all that together, and there's some pressure on Jack Kemp. Uh, here he is talking to me. That is uh, May of 1979. Wow, it's 42 years ago. Jack Kemp at that time was laying the groundwork to run for president of the United States in 1980. So uh, that's where I got to know him. And uh, we kept in touch over the years. Over 30 years, we kept in touch. And um, years later, um, I said, hey, Jack, and we, I wasn't covering anything. We're just hanging out together. I said, hey, Jack, I want to show you something. And I take out this picture. He says, you want it autographed? I said, yeah, you can autograph it. And then he looks at me and he says, what happened to your hair? And I said, what happened to your wig? It's white now. And there he is in 2003. Uh, Jack Kemp uh, and my son, Arizona Biltmore Hotel in Phoenix. And he tells my son, what do you want to drink? I said, Jack, he's 17. He's underage. He said, shut up. What do you want to drink? He said, Jack, he's underage. Just mind your business. What do you want to drink? And I gave up and Jack gave my son his first legal, illegal, legal drink ever that I know of. And my son said it was at a bar when he was 17 years old. Thanks to the vice presidential candidate in 1996, Jack Kemp, he got his first drink at a bar. And take a look at Jack's wig. It wasn't brown anymore. It was white. Uh, Abner Haynes said, one of the things the AFL needed was the unity of the white players and black players of our new league or for our new league. When the white players, Jack Kemp, Jerry Mays, who was our Kansas City defensive leader and four or five other guys heard about what was happening, 
uh, their character showed and my teammates were looking after me. Well, the white players go to practice the next day. The black players don't. They stay behind in the hotel. And there is Jack Kemp and Ron Mix talking to him to find out what's going on. And both of them concluded that these guys weren't going to play. And these guys didn't take any notes, didn't take a vote. They just decided on mass they were not going to play in New Orleans. They headed. However, they got back to the airport. They got back to the airport and they decided to flee. They ran from New Orleans. They reconvened in two days in Houston and played an all-star game. That was Dave Dixon. Dave Dixon was the guy who wanted the team in New Orleans who invited them down. He was really, really upset with what happened. The players just fled. They didn't want to stay there because of the way people were treating them. And he told the New York Times about the boycott. The boycotters had unjustly sullied New Orleans' reputation, complaining their militant action not only damaged the city, but would greatly retard the efforts by men of goodwill of both races to achieve harmony. The players fled. The AFL wasn't putting a team in New Orleans. The NFL was looking at what was going on down in New Orleans, decided the city was way, way, way too toxic. Couldn't deal with it. They weren't going to deal with that at all. So uh, the next thing that goes on is that uh, New Orleans is on the outside looking in. They don't have a team. But things would change, and things would change in a hurry. The AFL got TV money from NBC. Sonny Werblin, the New York Jets owner, got a call from David Sarnoff, who founded NBC in 1926, and was mad at CBS because CBS had gotten the NFL. He didn't get the NFL. So uh, he says to Werblin, how much should that SOB, Bill Paley from CBS, give them? And Werblin says $35 million. He said, here's $35 million. Go build us a league. And he did. Joe Namath would sign with the New York Jets. Part of that money that came to the New York Jets from TV used to sign Joe Namath $427,000 over three years. The Super Bowl would rise out of the ashes of the New Orleans boycott. By the way, none of the boycotters got in trouble, literally could have lost their jobs as football players because of the boycott. And Jack Kemp, who was an aspiring politician, uh, survived as well. Nobody uh, had any kind of problems with what was going on. The American Football League and the National Football League, both sides, the owners were saying, hey, too much money, too much money, too much money uh, spending on players. We can't do this anymore. So they work out a deal to announce a merger plan. And on June 8th, 1966, they tell the world that the two leagues want to get married, but, but there's a big problem because they cannot get married without an antitrust exemption from Congress. And there was only one man suited for the job to go down to Washington and get this done. And it's that guy right there, Pete Rosell. And behind Pete is me. This is 1986 Southern District Court, fully square in New York during the USFL NFL trial. By the way, uh, the USFL was founded by Dave Dixon back in uh, 1981. Dave Dixon, the guy in New Orleans. Anyway, uh, a sports commissioner is a hardened political lobbyist, and the NFL Commissioner Roselle was an old hand on Capitol Hill by the summer of 1966. And the first guy he went to see was this guy, Emanuel Seller, to say hello. And he saw two other guys there as well, Russell Long and Hale Boggs because these are the three guys that Roselle needs to satisfy in order to get this merger done. Uh, in 1961, Roselle lobbied the House and Brooklyn Democrat Emanuel Seller in an attempt to win a limited antitrust exemption. So the NFL could sell the league's 14 franchises as one entity to a TV, excuse me, TV network, either CBS or NBC, because those were the only two networks that mattered back in 1961. Seller got it through the House in two days. Estes Keefhauer got it through the Senate in a day. It goes up to John Kennedy's office, the Oval Office. Kennedy signs it into uh, law September 30th of that year. The Sports Broadcast Act of 1961 allowed the NFL to bundle its 14 franchises and sell the package as one to a TV network, either CBS or NBC. They would sell it eventually to CBS twice, which got Sarnoff really upset. Uh, the law would help propel the NFL into a different economic orbit. Two of the guys who were responsible for the Super Bowl, Russell Long on the left, 
Lyndon Johnson, the president of the United States on the right. Neither the Louisiana Democrat Long, who was the Senate's majority whip and chairman of the Senate Financial Committee, nor Congressman Hale Boggs were very excited about this planned merger. After all, they didn't see any benefit in it. New Orleans wasn't getting a team. Uh, they didn't get the AFL team in 1965 and the NFL was staying far away. And they told this to Roselle and Roselle realizes that, hey, we got a New Orleans problem on our hands. We can't get this merger together unless, unless, unless we have a team in New Orleans, but there was no expansion team coming forth. But it's back to the drawing board, Shea Stadium. Some of you may have seen Jets games at Shea Stadium going back to 1983. Um, Shea Stadium is in Queens, as you know, or it was in Queens, now it's been replaced. And uh, Brooklyn uh, is right next to Queens. And Emanuel Sellers Congressional District of Butts, a Queens con Congressional District. And uh, Emanuel Seller has people in his district that ended up at uh, Shea Stadium to see both the New York Mets and the New York Jets. So he realizes how important the Mets and Jets are to people in his district. After all, you could take uh, a subway, had, latch onto the seven line to get out there. You could take a bus, you could take the LIRR, or you could drive. Tons and tons of parking around Shea Stadium, tons and tons of traffic too, but you could drive there. So all of that works out. And Emmanuel Seller realizes, uh, wait a minute, What's the NFL trying to do? Well, here's what the NFL was trying to do. Originally, there was a thought some teams would be moved around. New York Jets franchise, they're owned by David, Sonny, as in money, world one. And, and he's a TV guy. He was Elizabeth Taylor's PR person. Leon Hess is on the board of directors of the American Broadcasting Company. Hey, you know what? Showbiz. It doesn't matter if it's in New York. doesn't matter if it's in Los Angeles. Joe Namath. Toast of the town in New York after his first year. He's telegenic, he's popular, and he's a big man around Manhattan. Hey, just move that to Hollywood. So maybe we could throw some money at World One and get him out there. We'll throw some money at Daniel Reeves, who owns the Los Angeles Rams. We'll send them out to San Diego. They'll replace the Chargers because Baron Hilton, who owns the Chargers, could take his team to New Orleans. He's not really tied to San Diego anyway. He's he was in Los Angeles in 1960 and just moved the Chargers there four years or five years earlier. And then we'll figure out what to do with Oakland because we don't want 24 teams in 22 cities. We don't need two teams in New York. We don't need two teams in San Francisco, Oakland Bay Area. But uh, Roselle's got to sell this to Emmanuel Seller and Emmanuel Seller's having none of this. And he gets assurances from Roselle that no teams would be moved because of the merger, it wouldn't be the Los Angeles Jets. New Orleans, I was down at Mardi Gras two years ago. Screw that, fire truck crew 2019, hot nuts. That's a guy uh, at Mardi Gras celebrating Mardi Gras complete with dark glasses to show that the referees are blind. This was the play that they thought in New Orleans kept them from going to the 2019 Super Bowl, a pass interference call. Uh, uh, that was not called by the referees. And uh, this guy you know, was lending the NFL seven weeks later, know that he was still upset with that call. Roselle and the NFL would uh, relent. They worked out a deal with Boggs and included placing a team in New Orleans. Congress approved the NFL-AFL merger within 10 days. The NFL was supposed to announce a team in New Orleans, but 10 days uh, is October 31st. That's Halloween. You're not necessarily going to do anything on Halloween. Uh, but the, uh, the bill or the merger is on the back of an anti-inflation tax bill. And think of it. What senator, what congressman, what congresswoman, uh, Patsy, Minks was, uh, Patsy Mink was in Congress at that time from Hawaii. Hey, I love inflation. I love inflation. I can't vote for this because I love inflation. Ain't going to happen. So it flies through like a rocket ship, both houses, and ends up on Lyndon Johnson's desk. Uh, now I know why the Ford Motor Company wasn't all that good, uh, starting with the Etzel through a Pinto, which I once owned. Uh, this is from William Clay Ford. He is the owner of the Detroit Lions football team. Henry Ford uh, was one of his relatives, and he writes to Congressman Gerald Ford. Uh, this letter is kind of written somebody who is like in third grade. Anyway. 
The Honorable Gerald R. Ford Jr., House of Representatives, Washington, D.C. Dear Mr. Ford, not Congressman Ford, Mr. Ford. A uh, sincere thank you for your able assistance in bringing congressional approval of the NFL-AFL merger. The passage of this bill, capital B, B doesn't have to be a capital B, will now alert, allow merger plans to go ahead full speed. Uh, important also is that the first championship game between the two leagues, again, a capital L, you don't need that, will now be played for real. They're going to play for real in January. One, one heck of a leather from William Clay Ford. Like I said, now I know why the Etzel was a failure and the Pinto was a failure. Uh, WCF slash JG. There was a secretary who actually wrote that letter. Uh, and there is the father of the Super Bowl, Hale Boggs, the congressman from Louisiana. The team goes to New Orleans on All Saints Day, November 1st, 1966. Johnson signs the bill into law, November 8th, 1966, with that pen. Public Law 89800, the suspension of Credit Act, which uh, carried a rider approving the merger of the National Football League and the American Football League. I guarantee you that pen does not have any ink in it. Oh, by the way, the Pro Football Hall of Fame, which has the uh, pen, also has a little exhibit about those guys, those American Football League players who boycotted. Uh, there's very little literature on it in the civil rights movement. There's the little exhibit in Canton, Ohio at the Pro Football Hall of Fame. Uh, there was an HBO special, a uh, 30-minute HBO special about that. And that's basically it. There was no help from Martin Luther King, the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, or the other, uh, the civil rights movement had started to splinter in 1966. So uh, none of the other groups uh, helped these guys over the 36 hours. It was them and them alone. That was it. And um, they accomplished something. Money. The league pocketed, eight, the eight league being the NFL, pocketed an $8 million expansion fee from New Orleans owner John Meekham and one of his partners, David Dixon, the guy who is bitter, oh, just 14, 18 months earlier. Uh, and that was split between the 15 owners, about $470,000 um, per owner for doing nothing. Good money back in those days. Uh, the New York Jets ownership had to give the Mara family, the Giants owners, $10 million uh, for invading their territory. They didn't. Harry Wismer did when he brought the Titans to uh, New York in 1960. Uh, the Oakland Raiders had to hand over, Wayne Valley had to hand over $8 million to the Morbido family in San Francisco because... They, too, invaded that territory back in 1960. Uh, the American Football League would expand to Cincinnati, and uh, they'd get $7.5 million, but they'd hand it over to the NFL owners, 16 of them, so they got another 450000 or so, which means uh, Mara gets about $11 million, the San Francisco about $9 million, and the rest of them about $1 million for doing nothing except taking teams in. Vince Lombardi, here's a question for you. I'll give you five seconds if you want to answer. Did he or did he not ever win a Super Bowl? You could type your answer in if you want. Uh, I'll give you, well, if I do any more, I got to pay Merv Griffin's estate money for the Jeopardy Think uh, theme. So let me get on with Lombardi here. Mickey Mouse versus the NFL. Green Bay and Kansas City played in the first American Football League, National Football League World Championship game. January 15th, 1967. The Green Bay coach, Lombardi, didn't want to play in the game as his team already won the NFL championship and referred to the AFL as the Mickey Mouse League. You know, Mickey Mouse is a second rate, as in it's not any good, it's cheap and all that. You know how much that rodent is worth? Do you know how much that rodent is worth? The, the house the mouse built, Disney? About 17 years ago, Comcast tried a hostile takeover of Disney. Comcast, the uh, largest multiple system cable TV operator in the, in the United States. And they offered 90, uh, rather $66 billion to take over the uh, Mickey Mouse company. And uh, the Mickey Mouse people were able to raise money to match that and keep the company. Uh, Mickey Mouse, I heard that a lot as a kid. Uh, second rate, this, this, this. Haven't heard it since Wayne Gretzky called the New Jersey Devils a Mickey Mouse organization around 1983 after his team Edmonton thrashed uh, the New Jersey Devils something like 13 to two. 
Um, you don't hear anybody refer to anything cheap as Mickey Mouse anymore. Lots of empty seats in the first game. Um, about 94,000 that uh, are in the uh, Coliseum in Los Angeles or seats, 94,000. And oh, about 31, 32,000 empty seats. Los Angeles is a big event city. When the Lakers are good and they have uh, Kareem and Magic or they have Kobe and Shaq or now LeBron, hey, people flock out to watch their games. Uh, the Dodgers, people flock out to watch Dodger games. Big, big time city, Academy Awards, big deal, big deal. Groundman's Chinese theater, movie openings. But uh, this wasn't a big event. Uh, people did not flock out for this event, even though the tickets were $10, $12, $6. $6. The last time a world championship game or a Super Bowl was not a sellout. Hey, CBS, Bill Paley, chairman of the board of CBS, founded CBS in 1927. WCAU in Philadelphia, the radio station, the first of the CBS stations. And uh, I had a friend, Hal Uplinger, the late Hal Uplinger, uh, who left me at the altar in 1984, uh, when we were building a sports radio network together and he, um, he decided to leave for this thing called Live Aid. I don't know if you ever heard of Live Aid. You know, this little concert that they were having in London and Philadelphia that was going to be on a satellite or something. Well, Hal left us for that. If you never understand him. And until he passed away about four years ago, I used to say, hey, you know, you left me standing at the lurch. Uh, by the way, if you do want to read more about Hal Uplinger, U-P-L-I-N-G-E-R, go to the Smithsonian website and he will tell you, or you will see the interview all about how he put together Live Aid. Anyway, he was telling me that uh, Bill Paley told Vince Lombardi, you're playing for the pride of CBS. Uh, you're playing for the pride of Ed Sullivan, the pride of Walter Cronkite, the pride of Arnold the Pig on Green Acres, the pride of Gilligan, the pride of Lucy, the pride of Red Skelton, the pride of Goober and Gomer Pyle. That's who you're playing for. Mickey Mouse, too. Um, the first game played January 15th, 1967, 26 days after the final approval of the merger between the two leagues. Uh, both CBS and NBC televised it using the same television feed, but with different announcers, different advertisers. As I said, Paley leaned on Lombardi. He's coaching for CBS's pride, except uh, Paley and Sarnoff really didn't think all that much of this game because they televised the game, they taped it, and then they sent it somewhere else, a race to, I don't know, have a Jeopardy over it have the edge of night over it, um, something, something. Uh, about seven years ago, the NFL put out a $10 million reward. No questions asked anybody if they had the videos. Just bring it to us, we'll give you the $10 million. No complete copies of the game have ever surfaced. The game you could see today, there's some video, there's NFL films and a radio feed on top of that providing their, the narration. Nobody. Nobody has those videos. They were erased. Uh, I keep all my interviews on things like this, and then they'll go eventually on something like that when I feel like it. Um, this is Jerry Kramer. Jerry Kramer is on something like this. In 1988, I did an interview with the Hall of Fame guard for the Cleveland, or rather Green Bay Packers, and he was telling me, he says, I was talking to Frank Gifford years ago, and he mentioned that he announced the first Super Bowl. Gr Gifford said he was fairly cool, fairly calm, relaxed, he went over to put his arm on Vince's shoulder and Lombardi was shaking like a leaf. Now, Lombardi and Gifford had a relationship in the 1950s with the New York Giants. Uh, and they won the championship together in 1956. And Lombardi's favorite player of all time, Frank Gifford. Gifford said that really made me nervous. Gifford, of course, was the CBS announcer and represented the NFL. Meanwhile, on NBC, where the AFL was, um, Mickey Mouse 4, CBS and NBC charged $42,000 for a 30-second commercial. The two networks paid $9.5 million to televise the game. Uh, but the league, they couldn't even figure out you know, who, what ball to use. Green Bay was on offense. They used the Wilson Duke football, named after Wellington Mara, the Giants owner, the Duke of Wellington. When Kansas City had the ball, they used the AFL-sanctioned Spalding G5V. Or back in the neighborhood in Queens where I grew up, the Spaldines. You might remember that. The pink balls, great for punch ball. And stoop ball. Played stoop ball. Didn't play stick ball. 
Uh, the rivals, there were a lot of rivals going on. In addition to uh, CBS and NBC, there was Ford and Chrysler, the two automakers. Ford owned an NFL team. Ford also was a major sponsor on CBS, Chrysler on NBC. NFL establishment sports writers, Tex Mall of Sports Illustrated. He couldn't find anything good to say about the NFL, AFL. And Kirk Gowdy, the AFL announcer on NBC, Baseball Game of the Week announcer, Boston Red Sox announcer, uh, they nearly came to blows during the Namath game in 1969. Just wasn't a game. It's more than a game. That would all subside as the, uh, excuse me, if you're a Giants fan, please excuse me for mentioning this. Tech Schramm, president of the Dallas Cowboys, who gave the nickname America's team to the Cowboys. I, I knew him. After you shook his hand, you counted all five fingers. Anyway, Schramm told me the Super Bowl kind of put the icing on the cake and the interest in the National Football League kept rolling until it was the most popular spectator sport in the United States. Not true, Tex, but there were a lot of things that Tex said that were questionable. 1965, uh, the Harris Poll said that football was the most uh, popular spectator sport in the United States. The game is played January 15th, 1967. The Super Bowl name, some people, actually just one person, the Adelphi uh, alum, Al Davis, who was with the Oakland Raiders at that time, Raiders playing uh, Green Bay in the 1968 American Football League, National Football League World Championship game in Miami, but he called it the Super Bowl. He was the only one. Uh, years ago, I asked Pete Rosell about the name, 35 years ago, and he says, you know, Lamar Hunt's idea of calling the Super Bowl the Super Bowl. I was corny. I said, corny? This is about 1985. I said, corny? I haven't heard that expression since I'm like 13 years old in 1969. He said, yeah, yeah, you know, like when back in the 30s and 30s and 40s, super, everything was super duper, razzle dazzle, or looky, looky, here comes cookie. And I looked at him. I said, corny? You were born in 1926, weren't you? And he laughed and I laughed and he said, I was. In a July 25th, 1966 letter to the NFL commissioner, Pete Rozelle, Lamar Hunt said, or wrote, I have kiddingly called it the Super Bowl, which obviously can be approved upon. Uh, I did talk to Lamar in the late 1990s. We're in Palm Springs, and uh, it was an NFL owners meeting. And uh, I talked to him about a number of subjects, but I wanted to talk to him about this one as well. And he said to me, it was one of the spur of the moment things. No one ever said, what are we going to call it? It was just one of those things that just came out of the mouth. It was not too inspired. Hmm. Or was it? I was eight years old in 1964. If you're as old as me, you might remember this toy. It's a little ball. It cost about 19 cents, and you just flung it against the wall, and it bounced and bounced and bounced and bounced and bounced all over the place. So I was happy with that. Here I am in Woodside. Certainly, we didn't have that much money, if any money at all. But uh, in some palatial estate outside of Dallas, the Hunt family lived. And apparently, uh, Lamar had a kid who was just like me and my friends. Um, he was home one day watching his children play with a ball when he first uttered those words. They each had a Super Bowl that my wife had given to them. And they were always talking about them. And I just used the expression Super Bowl. It was an accidental thing. I wonder about that. Was it an accidental thing? There it is, the Super Bowl. Mine was bluish. This one has specks in it, but it was great. Absolutely great. Uh, it was a whammo Super Bowl, but unfortunately, its shelf life was considerably less than the Super Bowl. It was a toy made of Zektron. The chemical engineer Norman Stingley found that when formed at 50,000 pounds of pressure, Zektron becomes uncontrollably bouncy. Whammo began producing a ball made of Zektron in 1964, double top secret. Oh, I know it's a double top secret because I used to watch Channel 5 and Channel 11 in New York. I used to watch Soupy Sales and Sandy Becker and Chuck McCann and uh, Sonny Fox, who just passed away two weeks ago at the age of 95 from COVID. And I watched Channel 11 with Jack McCarthy and, and Joe Bolton. So I got to see those commercials from Whammo about the Super Bowl. It was double top secret, double top secret formula copied eventually by Wemo's competitors because it wasn't a secret. Eventually, the Super Bowl would just bounce away and out of production by 1976. Joe Namath, that is 1988 up here in Westchester, Wingfoot Golf Course down the road from me. 
Uh, my buddy Bruce Morton is to my left from then ABC Radio. Bruce occasionally pops on with me and we talk about this, uh, but he's in Denver now. He's kind of busy tonight. So uh, I get to talk about myself. Um, history is written by the winners, not the losers. But hey, I'm kind of an unconventional journalist. I want to know what the losers have to say. And Lou Michaels was the loser. Lou Michaels was a kicker with the Baltimore Colts back in 1968-69. His brother Walt was the defensive coordinator of the New York Jets. The Michaels brothers looked a lot alike, an awful lot alike, despite the difference in their age. They're both big and husky guys. And um, Lou Michaels is relaxing with his Baltimore teammates. This is January 5th, 1969 in a bar in Los Angeles. And Joe Namath walks in with Jim Hudson. And he walks in quietly and then he spots Lou Michaels. He walks out of the place, comes back in yelling and screaming. Well, let me let Lou Michaels tell you the story. I must say Joe is a very cocky individual. I never expected that from Joe when he walked into the place. Yeah, fur coat on. I'll never forget it, a fur coat in Miami. And he points over to me instead of saying, hi, I'm Joe Namath. I thought he was going to introduce himself and say hello. He points over to me and says, we're going to kick that out of you and I'm going to do it. Dave Anderson, the Pulitzer Prize winning uh, writer, sports writer for the New York Times, uh, who I got to know. I was very fortunate in getting to know him because you know, here I am, 27 years old, and this guy doesn't have to talk to me, but he's a hell of a nice guy. Those New York Times guys, him and George Vesey and a couple others, really, really nice guys. But anyway, I have digressed here. Uh, Dave said uh, he was in Miami for the Super Bowl. He said, you know, Joe, anybody who's anybody, anybody who's anybody, Joe would walk up to, we're going to win the game. 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 Four quarterbacks in the American Football League, better than Earl Morrow. That's Daryl LaMonica, John Hadel. Um, and Len Dawson, and then he talked about his backup quarterback, Babe Perilli, and, and of course him. Uh, and he has this news conference. Take a look at this news conference. Can't imagine Tom Brady sitting in the middle of Clearwater Beach entertaining the media this week, whether it was COVID or not. And this is Joe, and this is Fort Lauderdale, and there's Paul Z Zimmerman of the New York Post, and Larry Fox of... Uh, the New York Daily News, and uh, they're around. And I could just picture these two women. I just could think about these two women. They're walking over. Seal, you think that's him? Sylvia, I don't know. You think we should walk over and see? Yeah, why don't we walk over and see? And they walk over and see. Are you really him? Yeah, I'm him and we're going to win. We're going to win. Oh, wait until I tell the girls back in the Bronx. They're never going to They're never going to believe us. Somebody have a camera here. We, we don't have a camera. They'll never believe us. Oh, the girls will never believe us. Well, there were cameras, as you could see. This was uh, in black and white on the back page of the New York uh, Daily News, New York Post, probably Newsday. Uh, and the Bergen Record and the Newark uh, Star-Ledger had it in there along with uh, the Westchester Rockland newspaper um, and the New York Times. And take a look at Joe. Joe is just kind of hanging out there. He's there in the swimsuit. He's got his flip-flops on. He's got his New York Jets towel. He's like any other New Yorker going down to Florida to get out of the snow and the cold weather, just like uh, these two women. Uh, maybe not like that guy in the back. He looks like he can't be bothered, and she looks like she can't be bothered. But Joe told everybody, we're going to win. And he guarantees the win, and the Jets win. The Jets-Baltimore game is the turning point. The first two games were a ho-hum, and people started losing interest. In fact, the Jets were 17-and-a-half-point underdogs. But Namath thought they were going to win. He delivered, so did his Jets teammates. Because of Namath's running his mouth and the name change to Super Bowl, the Super Bowl takes on a new life. On January 12th, 1969, at 1 o'clock in the afternoon, if you were heading out to the Orange Bowl in Miami, you could still get tickets. When the game kicks off, nobody has any idea that American culture, American culture is about ready to change. Uh, before now, everybody talks about, well, did you see the uh, pregame entertainment, non covered year? Did you see the national anthem singer? Uh, did you see the halftime show? Did you see the commercials? Uh, how many people do you have at your house? Well, that wasn't in existence in 1969. Flimsy pregame show featuring a marching band. The Apollo 8 astronauts 
Hanks, Frank Borman, William Anderson, Tom Hanks. I mean, Jim Lovell. Uh, Tom Hanks played Lovell in the uh, Apollo 13 movie, which you probably have as a DVD there. Uh, just circled the moon two weeks earlier and led the crowd in a rousing rendition of the Pledge of Allegiance. The national anthem was performed by a trumpet player from Washington, from the Washington Symphony, Lloyd Geisler. The Florida A&M University marching band performed the halftime show. That was it. It was done. The only excitement, the Jets forgot to bring the trophy back to New York. So they had to get Tiger Ferraro the next day to fly down instead of just putting the, the, the trophy on the plane to fly up to LaGuardia. He flies down, picks up the trophy, flies back up, gets a police escort, goes to uh, down to uh, the Canyon of Heroes by City Hall. And the Jets have this big celebration with John Lindsay, the mayor, and uh, the trophy is there. That's the big excitement. Oh, getting back to Lou Michaels. Uh, so Namath insults him. The team loses the game 16 to 7. And, uh, well, you see, Lou and Walt make a $5,000 bet because the loser gets 8000 the winner gets 13000 and they decide to have the bet who's going to win with the $5,000 going to the Padre at the church in Sawyersville, where they were in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, at least my, Lou, my, Walt Michaels was there in the 1930s. So Lou was much younger than he was. But anyway, um, so they make this bet, and the 5000 goes to the Padre. Well, Walt Michaels goes from New York. It's a two-hour ride for him to get to Sawyersville, two and a half hours, gets to Sawyersville, puts up Jets memorabilia and stuff all over the place. Lou takes a couple days to get there, and he finds out Walt does not pay the $5,000. Um, and uh, so uh, he's really embarrassed. And out of that $8,000, uh, he gives the Padre $5,000 for the church. And... Uh, he wants the $5,000 from his brother, and he never got it. The ultimate loser. Name it, the game, and the brother in the bet. Uh, nobody ever talks about Lou Michaels, but Lou Michaels is the Super Bowl ultimate, ultimate loser. The Jets' victory arguably is the most important in NFL history. It put the AFL on par with the established league. The NFL suddenly had a hot property. Super Bowl would go on to become a national holiday and the most watched TV event of the year in the United States. This year, they had, what, 90 million plus the streaming, uh, average of 90 million. Maybe 140 million did watch. Uh, it was not a highly rated Super Bowl. But, hey, compare, it pales in comparison to India-Pakistan cricket, which could get 600 million viewers. Lou Michaels had no idea that a chance ballroom showdown with Naaman, January 5th, 1969, would lay the foundation in turning the Super Bowl into a national obsession. And there is uh, Tom Brady, who won the Super Bowl this year, and his coach, Bruce Ahrens, with the Super Bowl trophy, the Vince Lombardi trophy. Vince Lombardi died in 1970. He died of cancer. The league would name the Super Bowl trophy after him uh, following his death in time for the 1971 Super Bowl. What you might not know about Lombardi, he was a civil rights pioneer. Uh, I'm quoted in a book called uh, Lombardi's Left Side about uh, Herb Adderley and Dave Robinson. And I'm quoted in the book because I did an extensive interview with Herb Adderley about life after football. And uh, this guy, Royce Broyles, who wrote the book said, uh, usually uh, other authors don't even bother calling me. They just take the stuff, put it in their book. And I said, yeah, sure. He said, I'll send you a book. So I did, I read the book and I found out that Lombardi was a civil rights pioneer. By 1967, remember the four blacks per team quota, none could be a quarterback, a center or a middle linebacker uh, because blacks weren't smart enough to play those positions. That was the stereotype. By 1967, the Packers had a squad with 13 black athletes, including all pros, Willie Davis, Willie Wood, Dave Robinson, Herb Adderley and Bob Jeter. Uh, Lombardi had gay players on his teams. He told the players lay off. Lombardi's brother, Tom, a priest, was gay. The Queen Mary, San Pedro, California. I speak on cruise ships, that ship behind there, the white ship, Princess, I spoke on. And I did a tour of the Queen Mary because, hey, you're in Long Beach. There's not much else to do. It's too far to go up to L.A. to get back to the ship uh, in time. 
Uh, well, it's not too far. You could actually do it, but um, I, we didn't do it. So we took a tour of the Queen Mary, walked around Long Beach. And uh, it is on the Queen Mary where the Super Bowl parties become a thing. Uh, the Super Bowl party, uh, the Super Bowl would take on the new personality, Super Bowl Seven. Uh, party Long Beach, San Pedro in California on the Queen Mary becomes the social event of the year in Southern California. Uh, and uh, I had a friend, Shelly Saltman, who was there, who that year would promote the battle of the sexes between Billie Jean King and Bobby Riggs, and that's part of my 1973 talk. Anyway, it began a new Super Bowl era. Parties, hey, they could have a big shot party. We could have one. We could have one by our house. And so if you're going to have a party, you better do it right. This is from 1998. I worked with that guy in the middle, John Madden, part-time on his part-time radio show. Uh, that's Sync Sound in Manhattan on 10th Avenue and 56th Street in 1998, October of 1990 excuse me, 1998. Uh, Dennis Steele, who I just spoke to yesterday, is on uh, John's left, your right, and that's me. And so if we're going to do parties, let's do this correctly. This telestrator doesn't work, but let's do this John stuff. Hey, boom, hey, hamburger, hamburger, uh, and, and, and chicken over there, and, and you got the dip, and you got your chips, you got your dip, you got your dogs over there, you got your cup, you got your cake. Oh, hey, ketchup, hey, ketchup and mustard. Where's the rye bread? We need rye bread. Can't have a ketchup and mustard sandwich without rye bread. You got rye bread? Party time. Hey, a spread. A spread. And by the way, John's favorite sandwich is uh, ketchup and mustard on rye. Uh, Super Bowl parties in the economy. Every community in America is touched by the Super Bowl. As stores sell big screen TV, supermarkets have super sales, not Super Bowl sales, because they may get hit with a fine from the NFL for infringing the trademark. And the Beer Institute, uh, there is such a thing as the Beer Institute. It's Washington, D.C., and they lobby Congress on behalf of the beer industry. And uh, Lori Levy years ago pointed out just how big a party it was. Uh, it was the second biggest food consumption day of the year behind Thanksgiving. You could get your big screen TVs for the Super Bowl on sale because according to the National Electronics Dealers Association, sales of large screen TVs increased 500% during the Super Bowl week because the event increases demand for television sets to watch the big game. Beer here, beer here. The Beer Institute has data suggests that the Super Bowl is one of the seventh biggest sales days of the year, only behind Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's Eve, 4th of July. And that could change from year to year. Non-COVID years, uh, Super Bowl parties have surpassed New Year's Eve parties as the biggest party day of the year for parties. Newspapers sell advertisements for Super Bowl sections. They can do that because there's editorial in there and you could use the name Super Bowl for editorial. The Super Bowl is a moneymaker for supermarkets, department stores, bars, snack food makers, breweries, and restaurants. Pizza, 67% more pizzas are sold on that day than any other day of the year. It's also a springboard for companies to start annual TV, radio, and print advertising campaigns. The actual game may take a back seat to everything else going on. The pregame show, the anthem, the post, uh, the uh, halftime show, the commercials, all of that's going on. Oh, oh yeah, and by the way, there's a game. Uh, the most famous commercial remains the Coca-Cola ad from 1979, the Pittsburgh Steelers, Mean Joe Green, Mount Vernon Stadium, down the road here, which is no longer here. It's been knocked down, being replaced. Anyway, he's all beaten up. He's coming off the field. This kid's trying to get his attention, and he does with Coca-Cola. Things go better with Coca-Cola, and they live happily ever after the kid gives Mean Joe Green the coat. Oh, wait, getting back to Joe. So Joe is this, hey, Joe is an A-list celebrity. He does a TV show uh, called The Joe Namath Show with uh, Dick Schapp who is a hell of a nice guy, by the way, uh, and um, also Louis Louisa Moritz. Um, and he's also does a Noxzema com shaving commercial with uh, Farrah Fawcett and uh, hangs out with Raquel Welsh, Janis Joplin and others. And uh, by the mid seventies, he's doing a pantyhose commercial because Jimmy Walsh, his agent, been his agent since 1964, gets him a commercial for pantyhose. And Joe says he wears pantyhose 
underneath his football uniform because it makes him feel real good. So over the years, some women have said to me, we don't want to see, Joe's cute, but we don't want to see Joe. We want to see his legs. I said, you don't want to see his legs now. He's about 74 years old. He's had a bunch of knee replacements. Actually, he's going to be 78 in May and his legs are all gnarly. You don't want to see that, but you want to see this, right? And I've heard, I've had ladies in their seventies just, and I said, you okay? It's only a pair of shorts and pantyhose. Joe Namath. Uh, and Joe today, uh, Medicare coverage helpline. Uh, I'm happy I called. Jimmy Walsh still has him working. Uh, this is very important. You better listen to this because he is on Medicare and he needs additional coverage. And that's Joe today. Some of the best commercials, Mean Joe Green, the Coke commercial, Apple Computers, 1984, the Sledgehammer, Pepsi, Coke guy takes Pepsi, 1996, Tabasco, uh, Mosquito Tabasco Sauce, 1998, 3D Doritos, 1998. There was no Budweiser at this year's Super Bowl. They decided to keep the $5.5 million per ad, 30-second ad, and decided to put it into COVID-19 education money or whatever else they were going to do to help out with the vaccine distribution. Reebok, Terry Tate, office linebacker, and Betty White just celebrated a birthday a couple of weeks ago. Uh, she was, uh, two weeks ago, she was 99 when she was just a mere child of 88, 2010. She did a Snickers commercial. Uh, Bill Bidwell moved to St. Louis Cardinals football team as we wrap this up with the politics of uh, the Super Bowl. Uh, he uh, moves his team from St. Louis to Tempe, Arizona in uh, January of 1988. Uh, he left St. Louis because of poor attendance and he goes to Phoenix and he has poor attendance, but he also walks into a hornet's nest, a major political problem, which would have NFL ramifications. Uh, as I said, he wasn't drawing people in St. Louis. He wasn't drawing people in Phoenix. So the NFL decides we're gonna help Bill, brother Bill, one of our own, and we're going to give him the 1993 Super Bowl in Tempe, Arizona, because 1988, 1989, he's not drawing flies. So people will buy tickets because they have a shot at a lottery to get Super Bowl tickets in 1993. But there's a major problem. Ronald Reagan uh, created the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Day in the mid-1980s. The Arizona governor, Bruce Babbitt, signed it into law by executive order in 1986, but the new governor, Evan Meacham, in 1987, canceled the Martin Luther King holiday, partly because he said there were too many holidays, uh, state and federal holidays. Uh, Bidwell took the team to Tempe in 1988, and there's a fight going on in the legislature, MLK in the big game. Stevie Wonder announced that he would be boycotting. Uh, Arizona, others would follow. Convention planners said we're not going to the state. The battle's on, and the NFL's right in the middle of this thing. In 1989, the state legislature passed legislation to create an Arizona holiday honoring King, but the opponents managed to get enough signatures on the petition to get voters in the state to decide whether or not to honor King in November of 1990. The NFL said, hey, pass the King Day, you got the Super Bowl. Don't pass it, we pull it. Arizona voters overturned the legislature's decision. The NFL pulls Super Bowl 27 from Tempe, and they move it to the Rose Bowl in Pasadena. But there's a do-over in 1992, a do-over. Uh, it's a presidential year. Clinton, Bush, and Perot are all running, and that means a lot of people are going to come out. And the NFL finds out that the initiative is back on the ballot, and they tell voters, vote yes for the holiday. We give you the next available Super Bowl in 1996. The voters said yes. March of 1993, the NFL gave Tempe the 1996 big game. The anthem. The anthem's a big deal. And the biggest deal of all was Whitney Houston back in 1991. And there was always the question, was it live or was it on tape? You got to remember that was the Super Bowl following uh, the Gulf War where Iraq invaded Kuwait. Uh, lots of lots and lots of patriotism on display at that Super Bowl. Lots and lots of security on as well. And Whitney Houston sings the national anthem. Real or on tape? Well, I'll let my old buddy Jim Steig answer that. Jim Steig ran that Super Bowl and others. In early January 1991, our coordinator of the Super Bowl pregame activities, Bob Best, produced a recording of the Florida Orchestra for national anthem producer Ricky Minor. 
A week later, Minor flew to Los Angeles to have Whitney record the vocal track. Amazingly, done in one take. And we wrap up this with something that became unwrapped. Janet Jackson's costume. There's Justin Timberlake on the right, Janet Jackson on the left. And it's the costume malfunction at the 2004 Super Bowl in Houston, Texas. The New England Patriots behind Tom Brady defeated the Carolina Panthers 32-29. Nobody remembers it unless you're a rabid Tom Brady fan, a rabid New England fan, or somebody in Carolina complaining about losing a three-point game. But, well, let's talk about this little thing, uh, what happened. Uh, Janet Jackson's costume malfunction at halftime of the 2004 game caused the political football and changed how TV and radio presented programming. ABC showing of Saving Private Ryan is impacted. Saving Private Ryan is supposed to be on Easter Sunday, 2004. The FCC reacted to what happened at halftime at the Super Bowl. Justin Timberlake grabbed Janet Jackson in a dance routine, accidentally forcing her dress to open, which revealed one of her breasts. That nine sixteenths of a second left a lasting impression. But did anybody see it? The answer, not live. Um, before there was Facebook, before there was Twitter, before there were other forms of communication, instant communication, social media, there was AOL instant messaging, there was Yahoo messaging and whatever Hotmail had at the time. And uh, people start saying, did you see what I saw at halftime? No, what'd you see? You got TiVo. Yeah, I got TiVo. Take the TiVo, go back to halftime and slow it down, slow it down, slow it down. So, hey, there it is. There's the frame. Oh, that is indecent. That is really, really indecent. That one frame. Politicians derided Viacom CBS and Viacom MTV. Um, they own both entities. Uh, which produced the halftime show. Within 15 hours, politicians gathered on the steps of the Capitol in Washington, pointing a finger at Jackson and CBS for promoting something immoral. Uh, the hammer would come down on Viacom CBS, the uh, Republican majority on the FCC, who's ever in the White House, which was George W. Bush, the Republican then, uh, got involved and fined Viacom CBS $550,000, changed in decency rules. Tape delay so you can cut out dirty words or cut out images uh, of seven or 10 seconds. Uh, Viacom and CBS would fight the fines for seven years, spend more on lawyers, and eventually would win. Meanwhile, saving private right, a Steven Spielberg, Steven Spielberg film. I'm not from Brooklyn anymore. Tom Hanks, saving private right, Edward Burns, Matt Damon, Tom Sizemore, the mission is a man. The FCC did raise the amount of fines or the amount uh, stations and networks could be docked for what could be term questionable images uh, and dirty words. In 2004, television station owners were scared off by the prospect of fines. 66 ABC TV affiliates didn't show the movie Saving Private Ryan because of foul language concerns. Uh, the TV station owners didn't want to risk a fine. Saving Private Ryan, which I pretty sure you have in your library, had won five Academy Awards following the 1998 release. It had been aired twice by Disney ABC, Easter Sunday 2001, Easter Sunday 2002. One complaint in those two showings, foul language, FCC ignored it. Military veterans groups were furious with the stations. Walt Disney Company ABC offered to pay the fines of the 66 stations if the FCC decided to dock them they just didn't show the movie. It had an impact. Meanwhile, the NFL is looking for safe acts right after that. They get Paul McCartney. He had been busted for nine, oh, he had been busted for pot in Japan in 1980, spent nine days in jail. His bandmate and collaborator, John Lennon, was busted in London back in 1990, came to the United States, was afraid that he was going to be deported, or if he left, he couldn't come back in because of that drug bust in London. George Harrison had the same problems. Ringo Starr went to alcoholic rehab, uh, Betty Ford Clinic in 1988. Um, the Beatles, Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club band album was recorded with some acid and speed balls, uh, but McCartney was a safe act, as were these guys, uh, Ron Wood, Ronnie Wood, Mick Jagger, and uh, 
Keith Richards, the Rolling Stones, safe act. I don't need to say any more. Uh, the Who, two of the original four members of The Who are dead. Uh, the drummer, Keith Moon, died in around 1978. Uh, drug uh, reaction to a drug, he was taking to lose weight because he gained so much weight being a drug addict. And John Entwistle, the bass player, uh, died uh, from a reaction from taking too much cocaine. Roger Daughtry on the left and Pete Townsend on the right. A safe act. It is more than a game. It's Bruce Springsteen, Mariah Carey, Michael Jackson, Madonna, Prince, Justin Timberlake twice, Beyonce, Jennifer Lopez, Janet Jackson, McCartney, the Rolling Stones, the Who, Whitney Houston, Prince, Lady Gaga, have performed during the events pregame and halftime ceremonies. You're not going to see an up with people halftime show anymore. That's long gone. The Super Bowl is more than a game. Super Bowl was created by Congress after a major boycott, which goes unnoticed today in the civil rights movement uh, from the 1960s, the American Football League Black Players boycott in New Orleans. The merger created by an act of Congress. Joe Namath changes culture with the Jets win in 1969. The parties come on board in the 1970s. The commercials become a big deal after Mean Joe Green's 1979 commercial and the politics, the politics of the Super Bowl, getting the Martin Luther King Day uh, holiday approved in Arizona and also changing, changing how TV and radio presents itself in the United States, all wrapped into the Super Bowl. That is me with Marcus Allen. Back in 1983, Marcus Allen was a Super Bowl MVP and I got my game face on there. That is uh, the Waldorf Astoria. Thank you, Nadia, for inviting me. Thank you for uh, having me uh, here for the last hour or so. Uh, I am here to take questions uh, or to hear any of your comments uh, or anything else uh, that you might have um, or stories that you have.